Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Dylan Dong, a graduate student at Caltech, to the show. We're going to talk about his discovery of a previously unseen form of supernova eruption. But first, we learn about another supernova, which is due for return engagement. We're also going to hear how Steve Wozniak could be entering the space salvage business. And we look in on Inspiration4, the first all-civilian flight to space. A supernova 10 billion light years from Earth was spotted in 2016 by astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope. During its journey to Earth, light from this eruption was split into four paths as it passed through a cluster of galaxies. However, only three of these paths were seen by astronomers. Now, researchers predict the fourth light path, taking the longest route, will arrive at Earth sometime around the year 2037. By studying the arrival times of all four paths, astronomers hope to better understand the nature of the expansion rate of the universe driven by dark energy. With several countries and private organizations now regularly sending payloads into orbit around the Earth, the problem of space junk is becoming more pronounced. From defunct satellites to failed boosters, the space around Earth is becoming a hazardous place for spacecraft and human crews. On the 12th of September, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak put out a cryptic tweet suggesting his new business, Privateer, could aim to pick up and remove debris in space. Uh, for those of you suddenly remembering that TV miniseries in 1979 with Andy Griffith doing the same thing, yeah, anyway, it was called Salvage One. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Now, Inspiration 4 lifted off on top of a Falcon 9 rocket on the 15th of September, just after 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, lifting off from pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This is the same pad from which Apollo 11 launched to the moon in 1969. This is the first entirely civilian flight to space without professional astronauts or military pilots, and the mission aims to raise money for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Good cause. The crew includes Jared Isaacman, Holly Arsenault, Chris Sombrowski, and Dr. Sin Proctor. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Dylan Dong about his discovery of a previously unseen form of supernova eruption. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dylan Dong. He is a graduate student at Caltech and has recently made a new finding seeing an unusual type of supernova for the first time. Welcome to the show, Dylan. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So can you just tell us, you know, um, supernovas themselves, there are a lot of different types, but all in all, they're not that rare. 
So what makes this one so interesting? Yeah, so one of the more common types of supernovae is when a massive star, and by a massive star, I mean something that's eight times the mass of the sun or more, uh, runs out of fuel in the center of the star. And that fuel was essential for sustaining all the nuclear reactions that are propping up the star. Because stars are so massive, they're always wanting to collapse under their own gravity. But th those reactions in the center of the star are basically like, you know, trillions of atomic bombs going off all the time. Right? And they're propping up the star with the force of those explosions. And when you remove those explosions, when the fusion stops, then the star implodes under its own gravity, and then it bounces back and it explodes in what's called the core collapse supernova. So you can think of this kind of supernova like a star dying of old age. Right? This happens to pretty much every massive star. When, when it runs out of nuclear fuel, inevitably, it's going to die of old age, and it's going to either blow up in a supernova or it's not going to bounce out again and it's just going to collapse directly into a black hole. But what we found is that uh, a supernova can actually occur at any time during a star's life. Like your, your massive star could also have a car accident when it's a teenager, right? Uh, and the way uh, that we found this can happen is if this star swallows a companion, not just any companion, uh, this companion is a black hole or a neutron star. Uh, this black hole or a neutron star uh, could spiral in within the atmosphere of the star towards the core. And if it makes it to the core, uh, it could explode the star in uh, a pretty dramatic supernova as well. And so we think that this is what we have observed. That's fascinating. So how, how common do you think events like this are? It's actually extremely unclear how common uh, these are. This is the first, uh, I would say, confirmed uh, instance of the supernovae. There have been candidates in the past that have been floated, but it's been sort of unclear what they are. Uh, and so based on one event, it's really hard to say how exactly common uh, things are. However, uh, theoretical predictions have... Uh, People have predicted that, you know, this might happen once every, like, 10,000 years in the galaxy. Um, from my paper, I think that it happens at least once every 10 million years in our galaxy. So there's a big gap between, you know, uh, the, the rates. But if we find more of these events, then we'll be able to constrain that much better. Hmm. And so a lot of stars out there, a lot of things going on. What, what first attracted you to look at this system? Yeah, so I'm more generally interested in just understanding how the radio sky changes over time. This has been uh, my PhD thesis at Caltech. Uh, I've been basically just data mining this beautiful data set called the VLA Sky Survey, where the very large array, the VLA, uh, which is the set of 27 radio dishes out in the desert of New Mexico, is scanning the sky three times over seven years. And so Every time the VLA scans the sky, I make a catalog of every single source it detects, millions of sources, and I check to see whether those sources that are now detected previously existed in observations of the same part of the sky, uh, either with the VLA or other radio telescopes uh, in the past. And so uh, I found one in particular that was associated with this dwarf galaxy, this tiny little galaxy uh, that's actually uh, an analog of the Large Magellanic Cloud, one of the satellite galaxies of our Milky Way, except this one is located at 500 million light years away. Uh, and it was not only, uh, you know, a rare event that was associated with a galaxy like this, it was also extremely luminous or something like that. It was, uh, we immediately thought it must be like a supernova or a gamma ray burst, and if it was a supernova, it would actually be tied for the most radioluminous supernova ever observed. And so we, we knew that, you know, there was something here that we needed to dig further into. And so that's what got us started. Wow, that's fascinating. So do you mainly shine in radio waves? You know, can you walk us through, like, what does that signal look like? What are we seeing it in? Yeah. So the radio waves actually come from uh, what's called a shock interaction. So uh, what happens is... In a supernova, your star blows up, but it doesn't just like vaporize into energy. Right? The, the material from the star actually uh, gets shot out at really high velocities, maybe like 
10,000 kilometers per second, maybe even 30,000 kilometers per second. And uh, that material crashes into the gas that happened to be around the star. In some cases, that gas just happened to be there and had nothing to do with the star. Uh, but in other cases, uh, in most cases actually, that gas was actually from the star that exploded or from one of its companions. Uh, and it tells you something about the star that exploded. Right? So in our case, the reason why it was so luminous was because there is a ton of uh, dense gas that was ejected by the star that exploded. And that was one of the clues that we put together to understand what happened. Fabulous. And are, are we still, are you still looking at, at this, at this target? Or are we, keep, are you keeping track of what's going on since it was first seen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, most recently, this is actually detected in a second epoch of the VLA Sky Survey, uh, in epoch 2.1. And we've taken, uh, multiple observations of this source, uh, I believe in like 2018 and 2019. Um, and we're going to continue to monitor the source until we can't detect it anymore, basically. And what that's going to tell us is it's going to tell us more and more about the gas that uh, the shock wave is continually crashing into uh, out at larger and larger radii. And that tells us uh, about the profile of the gas that was ejected in the first parts of the plunge from the black hole or the neutron star. Hmm. And um, so what do we know about this shell so far? Is it you know, what is it composed of and how dense is it? What do we pretty know about that? Yeah, so it's mostly composed of hydrogen gas uh, and it's extremely dense. So uh, the, the scale to think of is, you know, for winds of, for, for like the densest winds that have ever been observed coming off of massive stars, uh, those are about like, a thousand times less dense than what we're observing. Uh, and so there must be something that is like way beyond winds that is producing this thing. Right? And this is something we call eruptive mass loss. Right? This mass loss is not sustainable over like any, you know, reasonable amount of time. Uh, but, you know, at least on the, on the lifetime of a star, you can't sustain this for like a million years, but you could sustain it for a hundred years maybe. Uh, and we think that's what happened. Hmm. And so what, what would be left behind then? A black hole, one single black hole at the center? Or is there a full merger? Or... Yeah, yeah. So as the neutron star of the black hole reaches the core of the star, what happens is uh, parts of the core start falling onto it, right? And it starts to accrete lots of that mass. A lot of that mass gets glommed onto the object. And if it was a neutron star, then it probably accreted enough mass to just collapse into a black hole. And if it was a black hole, then it probably just became a more massive black hole. Hmm. And so, so you have, go ahead. Yeah, so you have this, you know, free floating black hole out in space. Yeah, basically. Hmm. Hmm. That is that is just so cool. So what other you mentioned, you know, of course the VLT, which is, you know, magnificent and you know, every time I think about it, all I imagine is, you know. Dr. Arroway in contact, you know, racing through the desert. We're at Ascension, 18 degrees, 18 hours, so, you know. And um, <laughs> so what other instruments are, are looking at this target now, um, trying to piece together the puzzle of what happened? Yeah, so first of all, I absolutely love that scene that you were, you were referring to. Uh, it was the first astronomy movie I'd ever seen. Uh, and I just learned about what right ascension meant and declination. And so I felt like... I was in there, I was Jodie Foster, and I was like, I found aliens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a very exciting yeah, moment. Such, for, such, for such a moving movie, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know I'm, I'm not gonna, you know, worry too much about spoiler alerts, because, you know, people have had like 30 years to watch the film, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> but just, watch, watch contact. Just that one scene where, you know, it switches from her being a kid to being an adult and, you know, just... I need, oh, a big, I need a bigger antenna, I need a bigger antenna, and, you know, then it fades out to Arecibo, uh -huh. and um, it's just big enough for you, you know, that scene is just Pretty cool. so moving. Yeah, but to answer your question, um, we've also observed this with uh, the, the low-resolution imaging spectrometer on uh, the Keck-1 telescope, 
on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And we've, we've also detected an X-ray signal from this instrument called MAXI, which is uh, basically an X-ray camera that's located on the International Space Station. And it's like just a, it's a slit camera. So it's basically just like drifting along with the International Space Station as it orbits the Earth. And it scans the entire sky in like a big strip uh, every 92 minutes when the ISS orbits Earth. Wow, wow. And um, so just curious, like how, you know, speaking about instruments, you know, in how this was, how Maxi is able to look, just look pan over the entire sky, there are some other similar, you know, synoptic large sky surveys going on in the near future, including BLAS mm -hmm. and the upcoming LSST survey. Mm -hmm. So how can they, how could um, studies like that help us learn more about supernovae? Yeah, so it's actually a super exciting time for this field of time domain astronomy for uh, understanding how the sky changes with time. Uh, and this is because of all these uh, large surveys that are coming online that you mentioned. Right? Uh, we're basically going to be getting images of the entire sky at you know, a pretty good uh, rate, right? Uh, and whatever we find in the sky, there will be tons of other information to just cross match it too. You know, if you find something on the radio, you'll be able to go back into the archives and hopefully some optical survey had, you know, observed that uh, part of the sky with a lot of sensitivity, you know, for the past year before the radio transient happened. And you can really, you know, pinpoint what that supernova was. Uh, so, we're taking lots of data. Most of it won't be used, but uh, the data is going to be there. And so as soon as we find something interesting, we're, we're gonna be able to you know, cross check all these different wavelengths and get so much more information uh, about these sources than in the past. Hmm. And finally, what's, what's next for you? Are you gonna give your sight set on a different target? Are you gonna keep looking at this or what's, what's next? In Dylan Dome's life? Yeah, so uh, I've basically developed a pipeline to uh, find pretty much all the sources that are appearing in the sky, in the radio sky, in the VLA sky survey. And uh, we're just in the process of publishing, you know, the most exciting ones. And uh, VT1210 is uh, probably uh, the most exciting one out of the batch, but there's a ton more. Uh, I have another paper that you know, I'm currently about 90% done writing and I'll be sending it out to co-authors or feedback. I'll be, you know, posting it up on archive, hopefully soonish. Uh, and that's about another transient that I'm quite excited about as well. And there's, there's more to come, yeah. That's great. I'm sharing best of luck to you and everything in the future. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. And that was, uh, that was Dylan Dong, graduate student at Caltech. Visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly into your homes with fun and informative interviews. Next week, we're going to talk with Roman Chaburuka, CEO of Space VIP, about the future of private spaceflight and what it could mean for Earth. Here's a clip from that interview. Well, the overview effect, as it's known, is the feeling that you have when you see our planet Earth suspended in, in the darkness of, of space and the cosmos. And you're able to see the world, not as you and I see it from our computer and Google Maps with borders and cities. You, you don't see it as a place, with, as a planet with borders, dogmas conflicts, nonsense. You see it as a beautiful blue planet and there is a sense of interconnectedness uh, that you feel. And, and I think that's truly impactful. Um, so it's, it's a matter of realizing that and then bringing that sentiment back down with you and implementing change. Make sure to visit with us on the 21st of September to watch the entire interview with Roman Chiparuka. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter to see every episode of the show one day early 
together with advanced viewings of our comics, jokes, and uh, a whole lot more. How do we do this? I don't know. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. Remember, you can watch every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Hmm.